Next, I don't know, eight, 12 weeks, we'll go through DDU Viva practice and exam chat um, for anyone doing the DDU. Um, I'm here each week. I'll do my best or it will be someone who knows what they're talking about. Some form of uh, expert will be here to talk to you through cases. Yeah. So if you've got any questions, please let me know, okay? Um, I was asking you guys to mute. You're not online. Cheers. Um, we'll ask well, lots of questions. Anything that you want to know, please ask me. Interrupt. This is all trying to uh, trying to help as we go. Do you want me to just do a quick outline of what the exam involves? Um, who's sitting the exam this year? Is there Joe? You're you're on this you're on this sitting, are you? And I'm guessing you're you're one of the only people I don't have a conflict of interest with. I've said so. I'll probably be examining you. So I'll do my best not to be um, not to be biased and uh, yes. too too much. Um, but I'll, 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 I can. So okay, the overview of the exam. You've obviously got two exams. Hey, Sam. Yeah. Hi. Sam. Hi, it's me here. I'm taking exam this year. Oh, fantastic! Excellent. Well, I've got two of you. I'll probably be examining both of you. Um, uh so we'll um, record this uh, so everyone else can have a go at this i'm doing as well sir. i'm doing as well sir. yeah fantastic hi buddy so who's, who's that I, I missed that i've only got you as 1790 critical care Bobby. right great to great to hear you hi buddy um listen so the overview of the exam you've got a friday and a saturday exam the friday is the written exam uh, we can go through those questions as well if you'd like to as i said it mainly just viva practice today but if we want to go through written questions i'm very happy to do that um i'll definitely be doing a lot of viva because some people are just doing the viva this time and uh okay so the written exam is going to be 10 questions it's a two and a half hour exam it's short answer questions uh they're a mixture of broad questions where it'll be for example some patients in shock how does tte help your management that would be an example of a broad question then there are more in-depth questions and an example would be tell me about mitral stenosis and how you assess it give me the outlines of what severe mitral stenosis is uh for example so those kind of questions um for the viva the viva will be on the saturday uh it'll be online and you will be given a password to the link that you download so you have the powerpoint presentation on your computer uh, please make sure that you've got a decent uh, internet link and uh make sure that there's there is some time set aside to make sure that you're uh, absolutely all sort of set up and ready to go. There'll be two examiners on the screen who'll be sharing your screen. One of the examiners will be asking you the questions. The other one will be marking you. And we've got very strict marking grids for both the written and the vivas. So it should be the same whether you're being examined in Melbourne or Sydney or wherever. Um, the viva. So the viva will typically be seven or eight cases. It's 40 minutes long and you get marked on each case with a, a five things so either it's a fail borderline pass pass passed well or excellent and the rules are that you cannot fail more than you've passed in other words so you can have i think we say that you can have two fails but no more in total you can have i might have got this a little bit wrong but you can't have five borderline passes so you can't have more borderline passes than passes and what makes a borderline pass is the multiple prompts. So if that's different from hurrying you up, because we every single candidate has to do every single question. So we may hurry you along a little bit, and that's not considered a prompt. But a prompt would be, you know, tell me more about the mitral valve when it's clearly stenotic or something. OK, so multiple prompts are, are what sort of generates that uh borderline pass or not but if you get things clearly wrong like the wrong wall when you're looking at a uh a toe view or something like that then we consider that a fail um clearly saying that the valve's mildly stenotic when it's severely stenotic or something okay does all sound good any questions so far okay um uh ravi are you cool if i ask you some questions shall we go through case one um yeah. 
45 year old woman, COVID history of asthma, increasing oxygen requirements and in ICU for NIV. Take me through what you can see here. Uh, I can't see anything, Sam. It's not yeah. well done yet. None of you can see anything? Then now I can see. Let me try something else. Hang on. Let's do screen share. Uh, desktop will do the whole desktop share. How about that? Is that better? Yeah. Cool. Take me through each one of these images in turn. So top left is a parasternal long axis view, which is uh, with uh, very high depth. So I can see the posterior area as well. So from what I can see, uh, Actually, you know what? Well, lines... Normally in the exam, we wouldn't give you this many images. Normally we'd just give you one, maybe two on an image. So maybe just, uh, I know it's a bit, uh, just focus on the top left view for me for the moment, and then we'll go around and ask other people other questions. Just focus on the top left view. Yeah, so top left is parasternal long axis uh, yep. with uh, increased depth. I can see the posterior uh, B-lines uh, on the lungs. And uh, from the heart point of view, I can see uh, probably the LV uh, is mildly, systolic function looks mildly depressed. I can see anteroceptal and posterior lateral wall. Uh, left atrium appears normal sized aorta appears normal and probably the right ventricle is a bit dilated on this view uh, mitral valve and aortic valve uh, look to be moving uh, look thin and moving uh, can i ask you to focus on what's going on behind the heart so behind the heart uh, i can see lots of b lines mm -hmm. Uh, that's good we'll leave it at that Ravi um, good but, job if I'm giving you a picture like this I think you're absolutely right you've got to mention the the heart but if I'm giving you a picture like this it's it's going to be what's going on behind the heart and what I think I think you're right there are some beelines in there but this mark around here this is all atelectic lungs or consolidated lung that I think we've got back here okay so, you know so for me with that you know the, the answer with the the cadence is great. I think you've got to try and lock into what that examiner is after pretty quickly. Normally, we we estimate it's about a minute per slide. So when we're discussing these cases, that that discussion of the LV and stuff is perfect. I mean, I think the systolic function is probably normal, but so that's not a pass fail. You say mildly impaired, it's fine, to be honest. If you're saying it's severely impaired and I think it's normal, I think that's probably something we're going to have to talk about. But you saying it's mildly impaired is fine great to give me the walls to say they're thickening normally i think that's perfect you know lv rv is all great but if i'm giving you this image it's going to be about what's going on behind the heart so just try and and it's hard right and it's not possible so it's trying to you know get to the to the get to the uh the stuff in the, uh, the 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 marks as fast as you can and that's where the prompt would come through it'd be something like that prompt to be can you tell me what's going on behind the heart and b lines would probably be a tick and it's pricking up the athletic lung you'd probably be you know half marks for that question okay why don't we move to the bottom left one okay so what do you see on the bottom left image so this one here is not hers what do you see in the bottom left image here what are we looking at and why So bottom left, uh, it looks like a uh, uh, pulse Doppler through the pulmonary vein. Uh, and like there are two Doppler images. Time. Hang on, what are we looking at? So it's a, a pulse wave Doppler, excellent. So yeah, yeah pulse wave Doppler. Uh, yeah, where's the image? Likely you... through the pulmonary valve. Pulmonary valve, sorry, these are pulmonary veins, excuse me, thank you. So it's, it's in the pulmonary pulmonary valve. Yeah, beautiful. It's just behind the pulmonary valve. So RVOT, yeah, nice. And why are we doing that? RVOT, yeah. So we are looking at the, probably trying to look for pulmonary hypertension. So we look at the shape of the trace to look for a mid-systolic notch and beautiful. the evidence of raised pulmonary 
vascular resistance Beautiful. and we can also use it to measure uh, pulmonary acceleration time Beautiful. Can you critically you appraise that back. image in terms of its accuracy? Do you think, uh, what do you look for in these images to make sure that it's accurate? So uh, I can't see the sweet speed. So sweet speed around 150 so that we can have three uh, beats nice. in the field. And uh, baseline right up to the top, the scale, a velocity scale adjusted so that at least two thirds of the field is, uh, or the Amen. image is uh, covered by the trace. Amen. And uh, uh, for pulse wave Doppler, we want to make sure that uh, the modal velocity is seen well. Very nice. What about where and, I'm pressing uh, the- For RVO, you will see the closing flick uh, of Amen. the pulmonary valve. Fantastic, nice. So it's about that kind of speed. Uh, beautifully done, Ravi. Smash that one out of the park. So it's that kind of speed to keep it going. Don't get too upset if the examiner is just sort of pushing you. They just want to get you through it. And clearly in that one, you know what you're talking about. So I'd try and rush you through it so that we've got more time on the ones you find a little trickier. Uh, Joe, uh, here are some ultrasound images. Can you take me through them, please? Uh, yeah, so it's a lung ultrasound and the images are matched up to the chest X-ray um to show where they've been taken so the top left is the right um upper lobe um and it's showing um lung sliding with um comet tail um bee lines that are quite um extensive and confluent which would just suggest some interstitial um edema the right upper lobe um I'm just trying to see on my small computer. Um, yeah, sorry, it's a bit crowded. In real life, you have a better, better sign of imaging. Sorry. That's okay. Again, um, the the plural um, line isn't moving as much, but I think it is still moving. You could put an M line through that just to make sure that there is no um, pneumothorax, but I think it's still moving by looking at the B lines, which again, um, there are several confluent B lines. Um, and uh, the bottom right hand corner, which looks like consolidated lung on the chest x ray, um, is also confirmed with the um ultrasound, um, which shows almost like a patern patternized lung with some I can see some um uh bronchial um air, aerograms. Um, and then the bottom right um, is again um, showing the plural line moving and extensive B lines. So the right side probably is more consistent with interstitial lung disease, whereas the left side is um, extensive by um, basal consolidation. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. Thorax. Yeah, good job. Uh, the only thing to add in would be C, uh, maybe having some uh, pleural thickening in there. Maybe it's irregular. That's potentially suggesting pleural thickening uh, in there or something like that. The only things to add. Excellent. Um, so, Joe, all uh, the ers and the ums, they make you okay. come across as sounding yeah. uncertain. Uh, I, hope that, I'm, I hope it's okay to provide yeah. constructive feedback. This is nowhere meant to be personal. Good. If, if they don't know, it might not be me examining you. If you're someone who doesn't know you, again, just like in the Sikkim exam, the fellowship, you've got to come, off as, come across as confident, competent, and uh, do the basics extremely well. And you've obviously yeah. smashed all of this. You know your basics well. This would be the kind of, you know, the, the kind of slide where you should just be rushing through these things, you know, confluent beelines, sliding signs, no signs of pneumothorax, interstitial signs, you know, boom, 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 boom. I think we need to speed it up a tiny bit and the ers yep. and the ums is that you are not unconfident about this and I don't want anyone to think that you might be. So just try yep. and just tighten up that conversation as we go through things. Okay. Cause some examiners tolerate it and some don't. Beautiful. That's good. I don't think I realized I was earning so much. <laughs> yeah. You're nice one. Nice one. It's uh, but that's, that's, that's totally cool. Uh, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Right. Um, can I just figure out which way? Okay, we've got RV dilation. Who's next? Chat. You don't definitely don't get to put your camera on. I'm afraid that's privity. I'm taking. 
Oh, so thank you very much. Deep. Sorry, you, you're in there, pretty. Can you take me through yes. this one? So uh, we've had RV dilation that we've seen on day three or four. Can you take me through these uh, images and what they tell you, please? So acute RV dilation has occurred on day three or four in tachycardia. Yeah. Uh, so image on the left, I think it's an RV in flow view. Yep. Um, showing uh, probably quite severe uh, tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, and uh, on the right, we've got a continuous wave uh, Doppler through the TR jet, uh, which is uh, 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 velocity is more than four meters per second. Uh, it's a dense jet. Uh, it's fully filled in. And it's arrow shaped, uh, and it's got an early cutoff. Uh, and I've got a, a max pressure gradient of uh, almost 70 millimeters of mercury, um, and all suggestive of a severe tricuspid regurgitation. Excellent. Um, and uh, the... Let's leave it at that. That's uh, all you need to yeah. say. It'll probably be just those two images, and that's exactly what I wanted to see. A tick, 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 tick. Uh, again, just a, a bit of feedback, if I may, and uh, please, again, don't take this personally. Uh, you said to quote, probably showing quite severe tricuspid regurgitation. Yeah. Just take all of those kind of nuances out uh, for people who don't know you. You know, this is severe tricuspid regurg. Yeah. The question, the next question would be something along the lines of uh, what features of the color Doppler make, make you think that it's severe? Um, so I can see a uh, severe color aliasing um, uh, uh, and uh, indicating severe turbulence and uh, high pressure gradient. Yeah, what's uh, normally, what would be the... Uh, and the green uh, color suggests that severity. it's crossing the night. Yeah. Um, so uh, the color pattern suggests it's exceeding the night Yep. Um, uh, and the... Uh, does that make you think uh, it's, the it's, it's across the filling the, uh, filling the entire right atrium? Uh, vena contractor, probably uh, um, high, but it's difficult to say in this image when the patient is quite tachycardic. If uh, I can say, because I don't a bit think color Doppler is filling the whole of the right atrium. I think it's filling probably about a quarter of the atrium. Uh, Why would the yeah. color Doppler not be filling the whole of the right atrium? Possibly uh, elevated right atrial pressures yeah, nice. uh, be beforehand, so there's not much of a gradient. Beautiful. And so tell me what else you could look at. So I know you already told me. So what else uh, could flow, you look at? Flow convergence. Yep. Uh, but again, all those things are difficult in this image because patients quite tactic. Yeah, uh, probably give you a better image in the exam. But yeah. So when we give you the questions, there's always limitations in there, particularly the questions. I'm not going to probably give you just a bog standard MR. It'll be someone who's got a terrible LV function along with LV. So it's all about knowing the pearls and pitfalls with each of the uh, each of the images, yeah, the uh, particularly yeah. acute versus severe and things like that. Acute versus chronic, excuse me. Nice. Um, blah, 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 blah. Michael, your pitch is on. Are you happy to answer a quick question? Yes, yeah, sure. Can you yep. tell me what the echo features, not for this patient, just for any patient, give me the echo features of a pulmonary embolism? Okay, so uh, in terms of 2D images, you'd have... Uh, an enlarged right ventricle so it, generally it should be about you know uh, a, a significantly smaller size than the left so equaling in size to the left um, that would show that it's you know dilated um, you can have acute tricuspid regurgitation um, and you can also have signs um, in Doppler sort of Doppler of the outflow tract showing signs of increased vascular resistance so the TR jet in an acute PE um, generally isn't enormous and often don't have a, a pressure above 60. Um, and in the pulmonary outflow, you can have a shortened pulmonary acceleration time with notching. Um, and obviously on 2D imaging, you can sometimes see thrombus as well. And you got some numbers for the pulmonary acceleration time for me? Uh, I think normal is less than 90. Um, yeah. And then the the um, I think the, the sign in a acute PE is the 60-60 signs, so pressure less than 60 on the TR jet and a pulmonary acceleration time less than 60 Good on man. the and if, outflow and, tract. And one last thing did you mention to me about regional wall stuff? Oh, so McConnell signs, so um, relative sparing of the uh, apical contraction with RV free wall akinesis. Um, nice one. 
and I'm not sure about the base. No, that's fine. Yeah, it's just a relative hyperkinesis of the apex is lovely from the Connell sign. Yeah, nice job. Um, sorry, but Michael is just our, our new Echo fellow, so he's just starting off and smashed that one out of the park. So that's excellent. Um, little tips and tricks, I think, for both the Viva and the written. Uh, I think as, as examiners, we very, very much think that this is, you know, you're not there to be sonographers. You're there as clinicians who are, you know, becoming experts in echo. And that means that the clinical integration of features is really important. Michael did exactly what was asked. I tell him, I asked him what the echo features were of PE and he told me, I think if there's ever an opportunity for you to show that you are using both your clinical now, as well as your echo skills to, to make diagnoses or management, just do your, do your always try to integrate that, particularly in the uh, written. Um, for example, uh, the classic one that's coming to my mind is if I ask you about how would echo help in the management of a patient with, you know, LFT derangements and, uh, you know, hypoxia and hypotension. If I'm asking you about echo features to help you in the management, tell me that if you see a massive blown out RV with RV thickened free wall and clinically they're edematous, I'm going to go looking in my echo for signs of RV failure and congestion because that matches with what I was thinking as a clinician. If I see that, I'm going to diarrhease this patient and think about RV protective ventilation approaches. If I saw if as alternatively, if I saw a big blown out LV with a massive left atrium and pulmonary edema, uh, that would make me think I'm dealing with a left sided uh, issue with raised left atrial pressures. Again, diuresis, but more looking at LV protective management strategies would be the go query, you know, inotropes over, over vasopressors or something like that. You know, I, I'm not, we're certainly not going to fail anyone based on saying they'll choose NORAD rather than dobutamine for an LV failure or something, because it's obviously more nuanced than that. I, I think it's just talking about how you'd integrate clinical signs into your, with, with echo features in deciding on management strategies. And as I say, it is not a clinical exam, but I very much want to make sure that clinicians are being clinicians, not sonographers. Cool. Uh, who's next? I can't seem to go down. Have we got anyone else online? Chat, are you there by any chance? I am. Sweet. Chat. These are yours. What's that? Uh, so that is continuous wave Doppler through the mitral valve, um, looking at the flow profile through the mitral valve. Um, it shows that there is some regurgitation and um, that the inflow um, is okay so I don't think he's uh I don't think there's mitral stenosis there but there is mitral regurgitation and there is a heavy colored Doppler uh, sorry a heavy inflow mm. there's the, the there's a solid <laughs> there's a solid curve there go on tell me what you really mean come on there is some regurgitation there there. Is a, the, it's well filled there's a, a dominant contour um all suggesting severe mitral regurgitation yeah anything else very nice so uh, I think the, you've got one of the one of the marks. I'm going to guess you know, there are maybe three things to tell me on this thing. So you got severe MR most likely because of a dense likely, field in jet. Yeah, give me something else. Yeah, most likely severe mitral regurgitation. The atrium looks dilated um, um, in the in the small um, yep. in picture there, yep. and um, I don't think there is significant associated stenosis um, based yeah, on this. Yeah, two more things. Two more things. See the whole picture. In atrial fibrillation, it looks Very nice. like, uh, in keeping with the dilated atrium. And um, last one atrial fibrillation, dilated atria. So look uh, at the MR. It's in particular the MR. It's going to give you, you know, you can look at the trace and it's going to tell you about the severity. You can look at the rhythm and it's going, you know, you can look at the, how often that's going to tell you this, the rhythm, and then look at the velocities is the last bit. So, uh, so the, the prompt would be: Do the velocities look abnormal to you? The I mean, it's a high velocity mitral regurgitation. High? What's normal? Uh, it's a low velocity mitral. Yeah, regurgitation. the other one. Yeah, low yeah. velocity. And what's the low velocity mean? Uh, I worry about the LV function Beautiful. in these patients. Yeah. Cool. That'd be borderline pass for that. You definitely got all the things in there, but it's borderline. So just again, yeah. see the whole picture and 
Yeah. So just yeah. keep an eye out for everything in there. Sweet. What about that one? Mm. It's shit, but you get the idea. Oh, sorry, I'm being recorded. I can't swear. Sorry. I actually don't know where I'm looking at. Sure. Uh, I think so. I mean, I'm looking at the pulmonary veins, nice. I think, yes. um, based off of this and looking for flow reversal um, in the pulmonary veins in keeping with severe mitral regurgitation. Yep. And it looks like there is flow reversal there in the um, in the mitral, in the pulmonary veins. Anything else? So let's just label each one of the parts to this. So, because uh, I think we got a little flow during systole above the line there. Yeah. So just label me each each part of the flow pattern. So the there is the systolic, the normal in normal flow with the S wave. Yep. The D wave. Yep. And then there is the flow reversal um, that's present. Yeah. Nice. So what's normal? The, the, there's normally meant to be an S wave and a D wave, and then the flow reversal is the ongoing flow through in between the and S wave. The S wave is bigger than the D wave, and then you get the little AR reversal. And so I think correct if we around the other way. Um, I think it's certainly. I I think there's probably some flow during systole above it. I'd say this is probably an example of someone who's got raised left atrial pressure. That severe. MR goes the other way. I should have said, sorry, it's a different patient. Sorry if I didn't say that. Normally these point and shoot, they're all different patients. Okay. Um, so it can just be, if you've got that blunting, if you've got it around the wrong way, raise left atrial pressure or mitral regurg should be the diagnosis. Very nice. And it's obviously important to say they're in sinus rhythm because otherwise it buggers up the, can't the, the yeah. AR one. Yep. Uh, all right. Shall I stop being mean to you? Let's go back to Joe. Joe, uh, tell me about this picture here. What's it telling? Different patient. They're all different patients. Pulse wave Doppler um, over um, the no words, no in, over the mitral inflow, uh, mitral valve inflow, um, and the e velocity is raised, which would suggest raised. Um, I mean, <laughs> left atrial pressure and impaired LB relaxation. Yeah, nice. It's it's basically not just the raised left atrial pressure. It's also suggesting something else. I guess absolutely raised left atrial pressure, but when it's greater than 1.2, give me something else. What else would make the velocity go up other than just raised left atrial pressure? And is raised it is obviously raised left atrial pressure in there, but you also need something else to I think get velocities that go up that high which is more blood, right? So what gives you a whole bunch of blood and raised left atrial pressure? It's MR. Re MR, so yeah. Typically good. severe okay. MR. So they, they say it's a, it's it's specific, not sensitive. Uh, so for trying to pick up over 1.2 uh, suggestion of severe MR. And as you say, because that raised left atrial pressure, but also a great big load of blood that's gone back, that's then coming forward. So you can see the same things in raised cardiac outputs potentially. So if you've got a, the, the next question would be, how would you differentiate this from a raised cardiac output? And the answer to that is looking at your LVOT, VTI, as long as there's no AR. Cool. Nice. Ravi, critically analyze these measurements, please. So this is a uh, parastonal short axis zoom view of the aortic valve. Uh, which shows basically shows a planimetry of the aortic valve. And the area is 1.5 centimeters square. Uh, there are a lot of sources of error for this measurement. And the most important is uh, you can't, you would not know where the cut is going through. So it does not tell us uh, whether it is at the tip of the aortic valve or the narrowest portion. Plus, uh, because of a lot of calcification uh, in, uh, at the commissures, it's very difficult to trace exactly the part of aortic valve and uh, to get the full uh, appropriate area. Good job. Uh, okay, critically analyze this. So that's the focus view of the LVOT in parasternal long axis. Uh, in this image, I'm not able to see the where is the aortic valve annulus? So I cannot really 
uh, say whether it is placed appropriately. So appropriate would be where the uh, valve leaflets are inserted or at least five millimeters towards the left ventricle. Uh, is there anything else worrying you in this image? What do you think about the value? 2.7 is, uh, I would expect around you know 1.8 to 2.1, 2.2. So this is very, very high. Let's say this was used to try and estimate so with again, the getting... So yeah, with the continuity equation, what would you? What would this? Let's say the uh, it was actually normal and it was two point one centimeters. What would having this diameter do to your estimation of the severity of the aortic stenosis? So uh, the flow is same. So if this is uh, overestimated, then the aortic stenosis will be uh, underestimated. Yeah. Uh, tell me what the continuity equation is. So continuity equation is. Uh, the cross-sectional area times the flow through the LVOT should be equal to the cross-sectional area or the aortic valve area times flow. the flow, flow through the uh, or volume. Nice. So VTI, sorry, VTI. VTI. So the, the VTI area. is, what's the VTI? What are the, the units of VTI? Uh, so centimeters uh, second. It's centimeters. Beautiful. It's just distance. So it's cross-sectional area times distance, and that's what gives you the volume, right? Yeah. So cross-sectional area times distance gives you a, a volume, uh, and uh, then you can compare the two volumes, and you've got the one that's missing is the bit that you can fill in then. And obviously, it just needs to be accurate. So these are the kind of things that we love, love, love asking about. And the reason why I like asking them is because they're harder to do in a critically ill patient than they are in a normal person, right? And what worries me is if we have intensivists who are sometimes maybe we cut corners every now and again when we're doing our imaging, uh, just make sure that we are as accurate as possible with how we're measuring things. So you've got to know the limitations. And we ask that over and over and over again. So if there was if you're just starting off or, you know, getting back into vivas, I would strongly suggest that the first things that you start doing uh, is you go through each of this, each of the valves. And you have a very clear idea in your mind of, first of all, how to assess a normal, severe valve issue. And so by the valves, I'm talking about AR, AS, MR, MS, TR. I'm not really, to be honest, going to ask you about pulmonary regurgitation that much because it's not that relevant most of the time. Or tricuspid stenosis, it'd be a bit of a waste of time, wouldn't it, being asking you about tricuspid stenosis when we see it about once every decade. So just those five valves, valve, valve issues. And you've got to know absolutely to the T how to pick up severe from not severe for each of those issues. And you've got to figure out, figure out exactly why each one of those are going to be tricky in the critically ill. So, for example, tell me how severe acute MR is difficult from severe chronic MR. How are you going to tell the difference in someone who's critically ill with a shitty left ventricle, sorry, with a severely impaired left ventricle, which is acute? How are you going to tell me that you think that is acute versus chronic? Because that's hugely clinically relevant, right? Because one of those patients is going to need urgent valve surgery versus the other one who you'll try and look after the LV first. That'd be an example. Tricuspid regurge. How are you going to pick up like that case I just showed at the beginning with a girl who had you know, COVID and then suddenly got severe TR as well as severe pulmonary hypertension, you know, that's because she had suddenly got COVID and then got a PE, right? You know, how are you going to tell the difference between the two of those? And that's because just because like Pravi was saying, that severe cutoff sign suddenly came out of nowhere and it was just a glimpse before that severe, that severe acute TR. There aren't that many things that cause your RV to blow out in two seconds other than us with the ventilator or a PE, right? So if I could encourage you to do anything, it'd be go through each one of those valves and just think of the ways that you, first of all, you recognize severe stenosis or regurgitation. You figure out how critically ill patients are going to impair that. And so that means either a hyperdynamic or a severely hypo-functioning ventricle, whichever side you're looking at, would affect those valves. And then whilst you're doing that, then you've got to think about how all the measures that we do 
are also super hard in the critically ill and how that's then going to affect your assessment and how you're going to do your best to make sure you don't balls that up, which would mean looking at things like pulmonary veins. I love showing you pulmonary veins. I love showing you hepatic veins with severe TR. I love showing you the systolic flow reversal in the ascending or the descending aorta. And why do I love showing you those? Because you can't mess those up. You know, you can't, that's not based on really on a Doppler angle or something, you know, you either can see it or you can't. And if it's there, you can't fake it, you know? So those kind of things are really useful. DSI, you know, I love talking about DSIs because it negates all of this stuff where you start getting a dodgy LVOT diameter measurement. You know, just look at your VTI. As long as your Doppler angle's okay, you can compare your LVOT and your AV VTIs, and that's what it's all about. I'm rambling, sorry. It's four. Uh, I might skip this one. This is a bit, I'll just quickly flick through this. This would probably be a bit esoteric for the exam, which is why I'll slip through it. We had a 70-year-old female, syncopal episode. She had a transthoracic echo, which suggested there was severe AS, as you can see by this slightly dodgy-looking continuous wave traced through a really tricky uh, TTE uh, apical five-chamber view. I'll tell you what, uh, because you're probably pretty bloody good at this, I imagine. So we've got a lady we think has severe aortic stenosis. I think there's a sub-aortic membrane it's that membrane. is being yeah. seen in there. Yeah. Yeah. How do you assess the severity of the aortic stenosis? Uh, obviously, the stenosis is not at the valve level. The valve is opening fine, and it is not stenotic at all. It's completely normal. Yep. The aortic root and uh, sending aorta is fine. So the problem is in the sub-aortic region. I can clearly see a uh, sub-aortic membrane in the left ventricular output tract. Um, first, I would, the left ventricular function and right ventricular function would put. Um, uh, first, I'd probably put a color Doppler across the left ventricular output tract, which would probably show turbulence uh, below the aorta, which is seen there. So there's chiral alias in there, which suggests some sort of flow acceleration uh, below the aorta in the left ventricular output tract. Um, and uh, next is about uh, uh, assessing the uh, uh, flow acceleration, which is going to be tricky in, 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 uh, with the uh, 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 toe because of the angle, obviously. Yeah. Um, Let's uh, see if she has say, beautiful transthoracic images and you could actually get it with your yeah. uh, with the continuous wave or the pulse wave. Yeah. Tell me what you're pulse doing. Wave. So, so, um, uh, so color wave, uh, color, uh, continuous wave Doppler will, uh, will give me um, a high velocity uh, jet. But again, I would be, it will be impossible for me to pinpoint the exact location of it because it measures the velocity very well, but it doesn't tell you where exactly the stenosis is. Um, but obviously, it's good for measuring the high velocity, the continuous wave. And then I would use the pulse wave and probably use a stepwise uh, movement of the pulse wave Doppler nice. gate um, and step it down from the aortic valve down to the uh, subbiotic region. And at that particular point of the subbiotic membrane, I would find a, a sudden jump in my gradient, uh, which would tell me that that point is probably the site of the subbiotic membrane. But again, the velocity won't be accurate because the pulse wave will be inadequate in measuring that. Uh, Let's say the pulse wave was adequate in measuring it and you were worried about aortic stenosis. Is there any way that you could try and estimate what the severity of the aortic stenosis might be? This is for um, excellent marks. This is for getting the plate, whatever. Uh, I guess the answer I'm looking for is, the, is using the modified Bernoulli equation. Because we're just using 4v squared. 4v squared. And that's because we don't use the whole equation because if it's if the velocity before the area of higher velocity is less than one, then we can just use 4v squared. But what you could potentially do is you can use 4v1 squared minus 4v2 squared. So you use the modified Bernoulli equation if the lower velocity is greater than one would be the answer to that question. Other things to do is just look, use your 2D estimation of looking at the aortic valve. It clearly does not look stenotic in this stage. 
but it's it's that theory. So I think it's really bloody hard, just like you said at the beginning, use pulse wave Doppler, finding areas of maximal flow and using the modified Bernoulli equation if if the lower velocity is greater than one centimeter a second. Nicely done. Very good. Thanks. Thank uh, chat. Come on, give me the scallops. If we're going to show you toe pitches in particular, we're going to love you to do this. This would be the next thing I'd suggest while you're doing the MR and the MS. Next thing to do would be to go onto walls of the heart. Let's do that first. So we are going to ask you what walls we're looking at. We will love to ask you about regional wall. But again, if you say it's normal and it's hypokinetic, I don't really care. If you tell me it's akinetic and it's normal, I might care. Um, so just let's start off with the walls. What are the walls that we're looking at on this parasternal along axis view? So that's antraceptal and infralateral. Excellent. Walls what are the, the scallops that we're looking for on the on the on the uh, on the mitral valve? I'm not sure. So I think it's P two and A two. Excellent. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll go through how you can do it. Okay. Well, how about the apical four chamber view? So now, uh, what walls are we looking at on the uh, apical four chamber view? And what are the scallops of the mitral valve, please? So we're looking at infraceptral and antralateral walls um, on the apical yep. four chamber. And scallops wise, this is a bit tricky. So I think we're now looking at A1, P2, A1, P3. Yep. And it sort of depends on what angle we're angling up at. Yeah, we'll take yep. that. Two chamber view. So now we're looking at the anterior wall and the posterior wall. Um, the of the anterior anterior wall. Inferior anterior, sorry, I beg your pardon, inferior and anterior walls of the left ventricle. And scallops wise, I think now we're at A1. P3, I don't know. I'd have to guess. Let's say it's a standard toe view for a commissural view at 60 degrees. Because that's sort of what I was trying to do here. It doesn't look perfect. But let's say I was in a 60 degree view, commissural view, a, a two chamber in toe. So let me just fix my. Brain. Um, so in toe, we would be looking then at. That trapdoor is what I'm trying to get to. So you got. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's um, in toe, I would then be looking at a, I think you get a bit of two scallops, of, two of the anterior scallops and one of the posterior scallops, right? So it must be like yeah. then a two, three, and then a bit of P1. Yeah, I, let me take you through them. I think it's, I was looking for, for P1A2, P3 for that one, but I, I appreciate mm -hmm. you're saying it sort of depends where exactly you're at. Um, not everyone loves this picture, I do, but it's if you're trying to remember your scallops, um, if you're holding your hand out in front of you, that's sort of how the mitral valve sits in your body. If you were to look down with that surgeon's view through your left atrium down onto your heart, and I sort of remember it like this. So zero degrees is just flat line across your hands. So if we are going to a parasternal long axis view, which is the equivalent of about 120 degrees with toe, uh, that gives you A2, P2. So you're cutting across your valve, uh, as you can see in your hand there. So A2, P2, just like you got. For your apical four chamber view, it sort of depends on what level you're at for, for zero degrees. It sort of moves up and down through that, um, through the through the hand. So you, I think you said it was, uh, what did you say? You said A2, A3 and P1, I think is what you said. Or did you say A1? It sort of, again, I think I said A1, A, yeah. I, I didn't say A3. Excuse me. So it sort of depends on what level you're at that. So I think that's a little bit trickier, but the idea being that you're going to be probably going through one of the posterior leaflets at some stage as you go up and down. And the big one for me is the A2, uh, the apical two chamber view, looking at that P1, A2, P3. It's that trapdoor, it's that commissural view, that 60 degree view on TOE. Okay. So okay. whatever way it takes for you to remember these, again, we like asking them because it's a really good way of figuring out whether you know your anatomy. And uh so at walls of the lv would be the big one um got to get those right uh mitral scallops getting them pretty close to being right is is preferable um who's next ravi was it ravithi are you next buddy 
Uh, sorry, I can't remember who's next. Is this, are we back to Joe? Please. No, it's Ravi, is it? Good. All right, okay. So did you get this? So we've got a 25-year-old woman who's pregnant, who's got marked dyspnea that suddenly occurs, and she's got a background history of, history of antiphospholipid syndrome. She's got a chest X-ray that shows that there's some bibasal interstitial markings. Why don't you take me through just the top two images there, please? So what walls of the left ventricle the... are on show and tell me about the mitral valve. Yeah, so uh, top left is the apical fourth chamber view, which is showing the inferior septal and the anterior lateral walls. Nice. And it shows... Uh, uh, what looks like a dilated left ventricle with a moderately depressed systolic function and the left atrium appears uh, dilated as well. The mitral valve tips appear to be thickened and uh, highly echogenic. Uh, and I can see some V lines on the posterior surface. Can the you right top is the focus to the just uh, just before you go there, tell me about, do you think the left atrial pressure is raised? The left atrial pressure seems to be high because the like, interatrial septum is moving to the right. Fantastic. And, uh, tell, tell me more about the zoomed in mitral valve, you know. Sorry? Tell me more about the zoomed in mitral valve view, the, the top right uh, picture. Yes, on the right, right top is the zoomed in mitral valve view, uh, which shows... Uh, Restricted opening of the mitral valve. Uh, the mitral valve appears thickened, especially the tips of the mitral valves. Mm. The posterior leaflet is moving less as compared to the anterior. Uh, but overall, there is restricted opening, and I can see like a hockey stick appearance as well. So give me a so differential. Probably you think might be going has, on with the mitral valve. So, patient has uh, mitral stenosis. Uh, it could be rheumatic, but I don't see any calcification or destruction of the mitral valve apparatus there. Good man. Uh, going by the history on antiphospholipid syndrome, young patient, this could be like a, a, I forgot the name. This 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 syndrome. You can always remember that it's Lisman sac. Yeah, we're excellent. Living sacs or morantic endocarditis or non bacterial infective endocarditis or something, or just weird lesions that appear on the mitral valve. All of that is perfect. Great job. Great job. Great job. So, if, if I'm giving you stuff in the history really nicely done, of course it's relevant. Of course, it could be rheumatic fever, but I agree it doesn't look absolutely exactly like a, what a rheumatic mitral valve would look like. And so that's why we've got other differentials in there. Um, I might just skip forward all of that stuff. So I'd have thought the differential diagnosis would be, you know, she's pregnant. She's got in, uh, the history of the antiphospholipid syndrome. So, yeah, non-bacterial infective endocarditis, morantic endocarditis, Lipman sachs endocarditis, uh, um, uh, infective endocarditis. Is it a bit weird to have tumors, thrombus or masses, other masses in there like tumors? Yeah, they're a weird spot for those, but stick them on the list. So just having... Again, pretty common questions, both, uh, you know, masses, intracardiac and valvular masses. I'd suggest, again, that would be a pretty high, um, you know, a, a, a high thing to have on your list of things to go through, both for a written and vivas, is having a nice quick list of differentials for uh, masses in the heart and how they'd be different in different parts. For example, if it's a massive thing that looks like a myxoma, you know, you're going to have to say also thrombus or infection in there, but, you know, it's got a specific look to it and the history will be suggestive of something uh, for a myxoma, like they're asymptomatic or they've suddenly dropped down dead or something with this huge thing or whatever, um, as opposed to someone who's got valve masses that look like that when they're an IVDU. Uh, we got time for one more. Yeah, we got time for one more. Um, this is a cracker. Um, okay, shows case. Uh, do you guys all read case? 
Um, it's the journal by ASE, the American Society of Echo. They comes out every month with cases. And it is arguably the best piece of journalism that's ever been written, in my opinion. I love it. It's absolutely fantastic. Chat reads it every day, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> um, and also, it's, it's a great place for exam practice. Um, we may have stolen some of these in previous exams when we've run out of time of coming up with decent cases. But it's um, it's it's really great, highly beautiful pictures. They're all critically ill. It's a really great place to just go through and see pictures. And so that's where I've stolen these from August uh, cases from last year. Um, who's next? Are we back to Joe. Yeah. Joe, we've got an 83 year old woman with acute bilateral lower limb paralysis. She's got a background of being a vascular path and previous out of hospital cardiac arrest, blah, blah, blah. She comes in and she is hypoxic and um, tachypneic. Limbs are mottled, no pulses. She's got significant blood load, uh, acute thrombus in her descending aorta, extending into iliacs and a right kidney thrombus. Wow. Okay, this is a toe. Although I can't see the... I think it's a subcostal view. I think we'll tell oh, you. Or okay. we'll have a little thingy on it, the omniplane. Yeah, the little, yeah, omniplane. Okay, so this is a subcostal. And the most striking feature is a gigantic mass in the uh, left atrium, which is traversing the um, mitral valve. And the diagnosis of this can be um, most likely thrombus because of the um, aortic thrombus that she has. And it's causing severe biventricular failure. The LV is thin and um, thin walled and severe LV dysfunction. And the right side um, also shows dilated LA poor LV function and there's a device which is the AICD which she had in the um, history in the out of hospital cardiac arrest so I'm very concerned about this lady. <laughs> nice. I love some of the things you did there you know if trying to you know it's a bit like in the clinical exam if alarm goes off it's a great opportunity to always say to the trainees to let the examiners know that you know that this is all a game and you know, the patient comes first, you know, for me, it's if you see something amazing in the echo exam saying, oh, my God, that's an that's an astonishing finding or, oh, you know, that first that first thing from you where you go, oh, my God, wow, that puts the examiner at ease because they, you know, because examiners also, you know, they put together these cases, they want them to be good and they love the ex the candidate being able to recognize that, you know, I think it's probably good to to let the examiner know you appreciate the efforts they've gone or their picture if it's their picture right and um, but also lets you show that straight away you know you've seen a hundred thousand echo images straight away you can pick up what the problem is the rest of it's just trying to put it in a game way that lets the examiner know what's going on so if you see something it's amazing say you think it's amazing just you know i think that's great uh if i could just make any constructive feedback it would be to describe the the, the I think you said it was a horrific large mass in the left atrium. Give me more. It's homogeneous. It's smooth walled. It's spherical. It looks like it's attached to the left atrium. It's clearly irregular in shape, though. You know, it looks like it could be a, you know, you definitely said thrombus is in there. Of course, it's in there, but also would be a myxoma with yeah. associated thrombus. Clearly, the history points you towards the, the thrombus because they're, you know, the fact that their aorta is just completely blocked up. So just just give give describe the shape of it quick and fast. Don't waste too much time. You know you've got one minute for this slide, but just quickly skip through it. And in there you've got to say that there's thrombus. That would be the pass fail thing for me in this for this slide. If you don't mention thrombus as being a main contributor in this, could be the be a myxoma, sure. But if you don't mention thrombus, you are failing this case. Um, and then the severe biventricular failure. Very nice. Uh, blah 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 okay uh what is this image and what is it showing it's a contrast image to further delineate the the mass that's in the la and there's no i suppose there's no contrast going within the mass which may suggest that it's unlikely to be a myxoma potentially which might have 
vascular should go in there, but also um that's fine. I think that'll be the, the parcel. Yeah. I, I think there is vascular markings in there. I think it's the thrombus that doesn't have the bit that's flicking in and out of the mitral valve that probably looks a bit darker to me than the actual mass. And this wouldn't be pass or fail. Um, it's just made just a, for, for me. Do, do you know what we might be able to do to, to, if we obviously disagree, we've got the two of us disagreeing. Is there something that we could do to try and tell whether that was a vascular tumour um, or not? I don't know if you've ever seen it. They didn't actually, I don't think they did it. No, they didn't. It is you, you do just a burst of higher intensity ultrasound uh, that destroys the bubbles. And then you see as they come back in and what you might be able to see is little bubbles that come and sort of uh, sort of squeeze their way through the capillaries of something like a tumor. So that would be the way that we would be able to tell whether you were right or I was right. Um, to, uh, with, uh, I suppose the thrombus would be completely black. Then, yeah, exactly, it? exactly. And you wouldn't have the little bubbles that come back well, in. How much of that was gain and... Yeah, good. Yeah, good call. Good call. But that's yeah. exactly right. You know, contrast study to delineate the mass, try and figure out, figure out whether it's got a vascular uh, nature to it um, or if it was all just uh, yeah, homogeneous, completely black. It would suggest that it's a thrombus. If it's got some kind of blood flow, suggest that it's a tumor. Yeah, nice job. Um, I think that probably brings us to the end of our, our day. Um, are there any questions that anyone would like to ask? Is this useful? Is this the kind of thing that is helpful Definitely. for you guys? Yeah, cool. yeah. Um, should we do more vivas or um I don't know if I know some of you are sort of by yourself studying for the DDU. Um is would I guess written questions might be something you'd like to do or have some sort of some marking or guidance. Hopefully your DDU supervisors can help you with that. Um, but would you like to sort of mainly focus on the vivas? Because I know we've got some people who are just doing the vivas here. Um, should we just focus on the vivas? And if there are written questions, yeah. maybe contact me individually, because I think probably these sessions is probably better for everyone if we just do vivas. But if you'd like to go through some written stuff, maybe get in contact with me and we'll try and uh, sort of divide and conquer with other some other examiners and try and make sure you've got support. Yeah, maybe just some practice with some questions, but do the vivas over Zoom, I think. So you'd, you'd be after that, Joe. Yeah. Um, uh, Prithvi, would you like would you yeah. like uh, written questions as well? Yes, please. Yes, please. Sir. Do I have your email? Can I maybe suggest yeah. that everyone who wants it, if you've got my email, can you email me so that I can then, I'll put together a little group. I'll send you something every week. I'll do my best to try and mark them. I'm generally a bit rubbish at that, but I'll do my best. And um, at least you'll get some questions. And if I give them to you, just do them under exam conditions, you know, try and do them to maybe a, to 13 minutes rather than 15. And I'd suggest you share them between each other so that you can try and mark them or something. But maybe we'll talk about that online. Um, also, I, I do recognize that sometimes it's, uh, you know, some of these, there are some pearls in here. If you do know any other DDU candidates, please encourage them to watch the videos. I, I don't want to be, a, you know, accused of favoritism or whatever. But um, please, if you know of any other DDU candidates, please encourage them to come along and watch the videos. Because I think there are some useful things for the exam in here. And I don't want to uh, overtly favor anyone. Cool. Um, any other questions or comments? I think Sam, email your at health email. Your yes, health Sam email dot org, o r d e at health dot new south wales dot gov dot au. Yes, please. The the work email is best. Ravi, sorry, do you have a question? No, I, I'm just a comment. I think this is a good start. Cool. Uh, to you know, re redo the process again. Nice. Well, we'll get um. I'll try and get other uh, examiners along to try and help with this. And again, if you're desperate for a one-on-one -on -one session or something like that, give me a shout. I'll try and squeeze those in um, and we'll get you through this because I think your uh, your knowledge is great. Cool. Thanks, guys. See you a little bit later. Bye. Thanks, Sam. Have a good afternoon, everybody. And a good one. Bye. Thanks, Sam. Bye. If you learned something, hit like and subscribe to our channel for more videos uploaded weekly. For bite-sized versions, follow us on Twitter at Echo Nepean and check out the tutorials. Or head over to our websites for the latest hands-on courses. Links in the channel banner. And thanks, thanks for, for watching. watching.